participate with you. All right. Uh, I do want to uh, talk about a little bit uh, background information. Uh, I've done I've done a little bit of everything. Okay, I as I grew up in Texas, I worked, did farm work. I worked in a movie theater, uh, projectionist, sold candy, uh, farm worker. Uh, I went into the Navy. I was in the Navy jazz band. I was in the Navy rock band. I had a career as a misspent youth as a uh, musician. And while I was in college, I was research assistant. I worked flea markets. Uh, then I uh, started working, uh, uh, went to work for at and Western Electric uh, Management Scientist, uh, kind of a data scientist is what you would call it today. Uh, then I, I went to GTE where I was in strategic planning and human resource planning. Then Texaco where I was a director of human capital for a, a while. Then I was a strategic planning director there. And then I became the head of knowledge management. And, and not being able to hold a job more than so many years, I, I moved to EDS as a VP of organizational resource planning. Uh, uh, then I became the uh, head of HR for one of the GDS, EDS uh, subsidiaries. And then I became the chief architect for their HR outsourcing line of business. Uh, then I, uh, I moved to SRA International on, uh, as, as the chief human resource officer there. And, and then uh, then I, I went to MITRE, and after 30 years in the commercial sector, I decided that enough was enough. I really wanted to give something back, and I went to MITRE, and I worked at MITRE for a while with a variety, mostly intelligence agencies, and then uh, then I retired from MITRE, and I worked for NASA for a while, and uh, somebody told me I'm one of the most retiring people they know because technically I'm retired from uh, EDS, from uh, Texaco, uh, uh, from MITRE, and uh, I don't know, uh, but I, I still keep trying to retire and I hope, hopefully I'll get there. But I wanna talk about my earliest fuck up. Uh, I mean, I, hey, I've been, I, I've practiced every year. I, every day I try to fuck up something and I'm usually pretty successful at that. But I actually got fired once during my musician years. I was with a small band. Uh, we were playing in a, uh, a country club and uh, somebody requested Folsom Prison. I was the only one in the band that knew the words of Folsom Prison. I'm not a singer, I'm a guitarist, trumpet player, but I knew the words and you're singing a Johnny Cash song, you don't actually have to be a really good singer anyway, you just know the words. But I had also had a couple of drinks that night and, uh, and there's a role, uh, there's a line in there where I'm stuck in Folsom Prison. Well, in a conservative uh, country club in Texas, if you say I'm fucking Stolson Prison, they will fire you that night on the spot. So, you know, I don't know. I, it was a malapropism. It wasn't intentional. But uh, there are consequences to what we say, even if we didn't mean it. So, you know, how do you wrestle with that? Well, th there's, uh, I have a, a whole lot of stuff I can talk about, but my education was in workforce economics, and I have studied how careers have morphed and changed over time. And most of my jobs, the common element in it has been how do people change, how do careers change, what's tomorrow's technology? That was a, one of the fun things I was working on NASA, is NASA is very good at putting people in low Earth orbit, and they're not too bad at figuring out how to get somebody to the moon. They, but going to Mars, they don't know how to send people to Mars. There's a change in the workforce, and part of uh, what I was working on is the chemical propulsion technology that gets us in low Earth orbit and to the moon will not get us to Mars and beyond. Yeah. We need to move to a plasma, uh, electronic, uh, and, and it's a whole new technology. It's a different skill set. Uh, we're going to be building uh, surf uh, structures on the moon and later on Mars where you have to use local materials. Uh, they don't have a lot of people that know how to make concrete out of regolith today because nobody's ever done it before. And you know the skill set they have hired. So so how do you shift gears? There is a government bureaucracy that's been around for a while. They know how to hire what they hire very well, and they do a very good job of it. Uh, hiring somebody different, well, they want to go back knee jerk thing. So trying to get people to break out of that. Well, my whole career has been how do careers evolve, change, shift, and drift. And uh, sometimes it's it's it doesn't always pay off to be the person that has you know a little bit of strategic vision. Of, there's a link I sent Brigitte, I guess she'll share it later on how to do scenario planning. I've, I've helped a lot of organizations with a, a future that's different from today. How do you turn? How do you move towards that? Uh, and uh, so some of the screw ups in my life perhaps has been when I've tried to been pushing perhaps too far and not paying enough attention to my audience. Just like, you know, people not somehow not appreciating fucking Stolson Prison. 
yeah, you know, uh, wrong audience for, for, for that kind of line, which was accidental. Um, yeah, you know, I looked at other things, uh, and but in my career as an economist, you look at opportunity cost. If you choose this, then you no longer have the opportunity to choose that. So one decision, career-wise, cuts off another avenue. And if you think of, you know, we we go as children, we go first grade, second grade, third grade. You know, every year you progress in a straight line. Well, once you get past college, that doesn't work anymore. And uh, organizations sometimes have these wonderful career paths and they, and they used to call them career ladders and somebody figured out that the career ladder was actually a stairmaster. You know, you're pumping all day, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, well, the same thing happens with our career. You've got to branch out, you've got to look in different directions. But how you make those choices, uh, I've had a couple of aw shits or, or, or fuck ups. Uh, the, first, I, I, I went for the title. You know, I went for the job that had the elegant, impressive title. And uh, one thing, if you don't know this, a little bit of insight here, job titles and position descriptions are managed by compensation directors. Compensation directors goal is to get everybody into a, a fairly narrowly defined buckets so they can benchmark it against narrowly defined buckets everywhere else. And the thing is, they have something that looks like a puzzle piece. If you think about you know, the thousand piece puzzle, you have all these little pieces. It's basically a length by width and hardly any depth at all. It's a very flat piece. And people are not like that. We're, we're tumbling hairballs. We're three dimensional, five dimensional test racks tumbling through space. And, and yes, you know, you're a systems engineer, except you, you also play flute. What, you know? And, and, and you, you, you like to uh, build origami, you know, and there's all these other aspects of it, and they're not captured to that. You go for the title, and all of a sudden, you've got a well-defined position with a fancy title, and it's a suck-ass job, and you're miserable. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Good one, Louis. Uh, organization design principle. It's, it's the thing is, how can we have that opportunity to grow in development? So, okay, going for the title didn't work. I found out your know, business cards are cheap. I had a friend, didn't matter what his job title was, he went down to Kinko's and he got business cards printed up. He was a work for a Swookie. Now, nobody in his organization ever heard of that. And I kind of did that at, at Mitre a few years ago. Uh, I've written some books, articles, things like that. And I and, and out of a, you know, make, make me, you know, award is time for you to retire. So the Human Resource Planning Society gave me a lifetime achievement award for my contributions to strategic workforce planning. Well, on the basis of having this official credential, you know, I went to my boss and I said, you know, I don't like my MITRE title. If I look at what I do, I am I should be MITRE's chief workforce economist. And she looked at me and she said, oh, if either, either I give him this or he's going to ask for more money. So, OK, they let me pick the title I want. So I am a chief workforce economist. And if you don't know what that is, that's OK. Nobody else does either, but it's OK. Yeah, but. I, I decided not to look for the official title, but just to look for the kind of work. So then, okay, go for the money, go for the money. I, opportunity came up, SRE International, they were the chief human resource officer. I met the CEO, seemed like a pretty cool guy. I went there, a whole bunch more money than I was making before, except I hated the work. I hate doing administrative HR type stuff. And then the, the guy, that the CEO there, who I thought was a pretty cool guy, he retires. I bring in a new guy. He thinks he's the new Jack Welch. He wants a Jack Welch in the original days was Neutron Jack. Fire the people, save the buildings. So this guy wants me to start slashing and burning and all of this. I says, you know, oh, no, no. Okay, this is not for me. So uh, if you haven't read Daniel Pink's Drive, it talks about what really motivates people. I recommend it, you know, mastery, autonomy, purpose, but money, is a really poor motivator. So uh, I left SRA in a very big paycheck and I went to MITRE and I, for 40% of what I was making at SRA. Uh, I was fortunate uh, far enough along my career while I was at Texaco and EDS, I you know, got some savings here and there. So you know, I, I was able to afford to walk away from a big paycheck and, and try to focus on something that was really important to me. I, I get to MITRE and I, I, my first boss at MITRE, wonderful person, but she looks at me and she sees 30 years of commercial world. She says, okay, you need to understand how the government works 
So we're going to put you in a experience broadening role where you will learn all about government acquisition processes. And so she she puts me in a role as the the program manager for a program that 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 hired contract labor for one of the government agencies. Okay, ah. It's, it's a minute trivia. It's not every I cross every T. There's no creativity, originality. It's, it's check all the boxes. And, you know, I did it. I learned the language. I learned the acquisition terminology and all that. I couldn't get out of it fast enough. I worked in some of the most fun projects of my career, except for NASA at, at, at MITRE. But it was, you know, going for title, going for money, going for experience. The decisions I made were fuck ups. They made me miserable. And I had to you know, kind of say, wait a minute, what is it that I really want to do? And I kind of fall back to Daniel Pink again. You know, master, you want to you want to feel really good. You want to be a master at something that's important to you. Autonomy, you want to have a certain amount of flexibility in how you decide to do things. And then the purpose is you want to be involved in something that's bigger than yourself. And I've kind of used those as, as my roles going forward. And the thing is, you know, uh, lots of people have a path that this is what you should do. And the point is, that's their path. We have to find our own path. And it's, it's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a zigzag and, you know, step forward, step back, opportunity costs. Uh, but uh, embrace the mistakes, learn from them, and move on. And hopefully that's what I've done. And, and now I'd like to move on to Louie. Oh, thanks for that. Um... Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Louis. Um, I have kind of a weird background. I, I know Brigitte because we've, we've beaten each other's ass several times. Um, I've done a lot of things over the years, but um, I, I for a while taught at the same martial arts school that she taught. Um, but I've done a lot of things. My background is, um, uh, so I, I started college when I was 16. And since I'm 45 now, and in that time, I've gotten a couple of engineering degrees. Um, I've served as a United States Marine. I've done some really cool projects. I've been to 30 countries on five different continents, usually because work is sending me there. Um, I've taught a lot of things. A lot of times I find myself in a role where I'm, I'm an instructor and I've taught everything from knife combatives. If, if you look up my name on YouTube, I think the number one video is me teaching leg locks in a Soviet era fallout shelter in Moscow. Um, but I, I also teach how the internals of the Linux kernel work. Uh, so I, I like teaching, I like talking in front of people. I'm very thankful for that Brigitte asked me to come here. Uh, currently, I'm a director at a large company. Um, we focus, my, my department focuses on cybersecurity, um, but it was a very circuitous path to get from where I started to where right now. And when Brigitte reached out and said, hey, I'd like you to talk about Fox, and in particular, I want you to talk about winging it. I was like, oh yeah, I'm in my element because uh, winging it has been a, a very consistent theme throughout the years. And I like to share, I, I, I'm not big on PowerPoint, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And it's actually not PowerPoint, it's Keynote because I'm on a different machine here. Can you guys see my screen okay? I see I see thumbs up, awesome. Yep. All right. Yeah, we can see you. All right, so um, when I was about 14, I'm, I, I promise to keep my backstory short. You know, I, 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 how I watch television changed. I stopped from being like, I'm passively watching a cartoon that's entertaining me to like, I'm seeing people that I want to be like. And I grew up, I was born in 75, I grew up in the 80s. And so for me, the, the main characters that really captured my imagination were these two guys. I don't know, do you guys recognize uh, these, these particular television shows? The guy on the left who's, this is, uh, this is MacGyver. And then on the right hand side, this is Quantum Leap. And these guys, you know, every time I would watch them, I, I would have this little voice in the back of my head saying, you know, they, these guys would solve problems. And they would typically solve problems they were dropped into with very little uh, forewarning. Uh, the, the main premise of MacGyver is this guy is like a chemistry genius, but he also understands electronics and physics. He doesn't carry anything with him. He carries a little pocket knife. And, you know, it doesn't matter where you drop him in the world. He's able to be uh, effective on very short notice. And I was like, oh my God, I want to be like that guy. Uh, Quantum Leap was even cooler. The whole premise of this story was, um, you know, this, this guy gets kind of shot back in time anytime that uh, from the year he was born, which is about 1950, and he'll just appear in somebody's body with no backstory, no context. The whole world sees them, him as the man or woman that he, he leaps into, and he has to figure out what their problem is and, and how to leap out of the body. And he has kind of the 1989 equivalent of Google here. His, his friend kind of uh, goes out and does research for him. Um, but both of these characters, are like, they, they epitomize winging it. 
And so when I was watching these guys growing up, I was like, you know, how do I be like that? I've got a little voice in my head when they solve a problem, like, would you be able to do that? And the answer was always no, because I was 14 and 14 year olds don't know anything. Um, but it was a cool voice because it kept pushing me and uh, it, it never really stopped. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of times where winging it. I've got a couple of stories. Uh, one's very early in my career and the other one's more recent in my career. And basically there were, there were times where there were amazing fuck ups, but how they led to better things. And so uh, this is a roof in Bogota, Colombia. This was taken in the, in the late 90s, as you can see from the screenshot here. Um, I, I was in a pretty cool gig where my company needed somebody to go to South America. And they, we had to go to several different locations. The main idea was you know, there's places where drugs are manufactured and then there's places where drugs are distributed. And the places where the drugs are distributed, they have good infrastructure. They'll have like a good police station. They'll have resources they can throw at it. But the places where the drugs are manufactured, you're talking about going out in the jungle. You're talking about places where you're not guaranteed to have power all the times of the day. You, you might not even have restaurants in your area. The hotel, there might be one hotel within like a 30 mile radius. These are very remote areas for a reason. So uh, in 1998, my company said, hey, we're looking for engineers that want to go down and want to build antennas so that uh, and, and set up computers and do training for police departments so that the places where the drugs are made, you can maybe take pictures with your really terrible by today's standards 1999 phone and send it encrypted over a, a, an HF link uh, so that a police station in, in Bogota, Colombia will be able to handle it. And at the time, Bogota was uh, one of the most dangerous places in the world. This was the kidnapping capital of the world in 1999. And um, I was like, hey, this seems like something MacGyver would totally be all over. So I, I volunteered for it and I didn't know it at the time, but I was winging it. So I, I knew about antennas. I knew how to set things up. I knew how to, how to configure a computer. Um, but there's, as I was preparing for this, I realized there's, there's multiple reasons to wing it. And one of the most common reasons you're winging it is because you just don't know the complexity of the problem you're stepping into. Uh, it's kind of like you're on the wrong side of Dunning-Kruger where you, you think I'm gonna be great at this uh, because you don't know the full scope of what you're stepping into. And so I'm pretty sure I made every single mistake it is possible for a 24-year-old Marine to make going to one of the most dangerous places in the world. Uh, I got my ass chewed by the gentleman in black who's now deceased. This is me over here on the left. Um, this is the same roof I got my ass chewed for 30 minutes because um, I couldn't control my 24-year-old me with poor impulse control. I couldn't control my sense of humor. So I, I pulled a harmless prank that embarrassed my boss and embarrassed the customer. And we're in the middle of a police department in downtown Bogota. And it really put at jeopardy the entire uh, five minute seemingly, I, I'm pretty sure that somebody back here would, would have caught in, caught flames from the, the level of profanity and just uh, ass chewing that it wasn't just me. It was, there was also the smiling guy on the right. Uh, he's, he was a troublemaker too. Um, but yeah, this is, this is something where even if you have a technical competence, you, you don't understand that you're stepping into an entirely different culture. And your sense of humor that seems great when you're in your 20s, it, it doesn't universally translate. And in fact, you will piss people off and you'll put a mission at risk if you don't know what you're doing. That was, that was a mistake I made. Uh, my fuck ups did not end there. This, was a, this is a photograph of a police station. And those guys are not uh, waving a peace symbol at me. These are folks saying, do not take photographs of this particular building. I had never been outside the United States. Well, I had, I hadn't traveled since I was three or four. And so um, while I was technically competent, when I stepped into this role, which is like, all right, you have to be competent in, a, in, a, in an area you've never been in before. Uh, I rapidly learned that there is an entire world of, of considerations that I had not even planned for. I was detained for several hours for taking this photograph in, in a Colombian uh, I didn't go into the, I didn't go into a jail cell, but I was the next step. And there was considerable effort that, that kept my happy ass out of, uh, out of jail that time. Um, other little things, you know, I, I didn't bother to learn the language. You know, I was relying on interpreters that were, have, like some of the places I was at, they had interpreters, other places they didn't. So I got really good at charades. You know, I, I, I could have learned Spanish. I took Spanish in high school, but I didn't take it seriously for this trip. Didn't learn any Portuguese. I figured they're going to be similar enough. Uh, I was wrong there. I didn't take into account logistics. You know, I said, hey, if, if I, I, I don't need to pack extras, I got everything I need. If something breaks, I'll just go to the store and get a new one. Um, that's not the case in a lot of places. Uh, this is the first time I was really face to face with um, 
parts of the world where poverty is normal, but not so much in Bogota, but you get out to some of the more rural areas um, and, and poverty is the norm. And I'd never, I'd never, I'd read about it, but it's not the same until you experience it. And so the trip, uh, spoiler alert, the trip was successful in spite of me. Um, but I came off of this and I thought, man, I, I screwed up about 16 or 17 different ways because I had no idea what I was getting into. And I would, had a big temptation to say, I'm never signing up for anything like that again. But that voice in the back of my head, that's just like, dude, MacGyver would have been all over that. I learned a tremendous amount of lessons. I learned that the cost of being one of these people who is remarkably capable on short notice in a domain that they have not practiced for is you have to practice for it. And you have to have a place where it's safe to fail because the price of admission to being an expert is you have to fuck up a lot. And so I started thinking about, well, well how could I prep for this better? I want to do this again. I don't want to bury my head in the sand. And so I started looking for opportunities on my own dime uh, where I could do better. I started taking some language lessons. There were some free courses. This is the, the late 90s, early 2000s. I, I started traveling on my own. And it, it went from being an interest to becoming a hobby to becoming a passion. And, and even though this was stuff I was doing, this, this trip was paid for by work. Uh, but for the next five or six years, I did a lot of trips where it was just me. I'd, I'd backpack solo in a country and try to learn as much of the language as I could for the two weeks that I was there. I made tremendous number of mistakes doing that, but I got better each time. You know, I, I had problems with street hustlers and swindlers. I'd never, I grew up in Appalachia. You know, I, I, I'd go to these countries thinking, you know, oh, I'm from America. I'm totally going to outsmart these people. And like, no, you, 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 you learn, you gain wisdom one terrible mistake at a time, but they build on each other. You, you need a sandbox where you can fail badly and make incremental steps and not give up. Um, by the time 10 years later rolled around, um, my hobby had got to the point where, you know, people at work started to notice. And now every, maybe it happened every once a year, or maybe every other year, there would be opportunities where somebody needs something difficult done in a desert or they need it done in a, in a remote country. And my name would come to the top of the list. And it was because I had on my own done a lot of uh, preparation so that I wouldn't do the same fiasco that occurred to me in the, in the 1990s. So that was one example of not even knowing that I was winging it. Um, I wanted to point out this book. This, is, this guy is an amazing guy, Eric Greitens. He's also kind of a piece of shit. Um, he's, he's an impressive human being. He's a Navy SEAL. He's a Rhodes Scholar, which is a very rare combination to have. Um, he was at one point the governor of Missouri. Uh, he, he had to resign in, in uh, a bit of, uh, there was, there was controversy because uh, he used his power and influence to basically, uh, he, he had an affair with a lady and then tried to blackmail her. Uh, and he used his position of power to basically be a slime bag. I still recommend the book. I think this is the book that I've highlighted the most in my life. And there's an awesome phrase in it that if you're not failing from time to time, there are two possibilities. And one is that you're Superman, or two is that you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And two guesses is which one's most likely. The, this book is written as a series of philosophy lessons, Stoic philosophy, mostly from like Marcus Aurelius. But it's a series of letters between this guy and a friend of his from the Navy SEAL teams uh, who was having a hard time adjusting to civilian life. The guy had uh, become an alcoholic. He was uh, bankrupt. His business had failed. He was going to prison. And this was a series of letters to basically between this guy and his friend to try to help him kind of gain a foothold back into to being a productive member of society. A lot of wisdom in here. Ignore the fact that it was written by a guy who's, who's got some, some moral blemishes. Um, that was one type of winging it. There's another type of winging it that sometimes you have to do it because you, you, you know that you haven't had time to prep for it, but there's something that has to be done. And maybe there's no one else in the room who's able to, or maybe there's nobody else in the room who's willing to, but there's sometimes when, when a, a job needs to happen and you have to be willing to say, I, I'm not guaranteed of success, but I'm, I'm going to step into this role. That happened to me. I, I, I'd had a, a really good career at a place building hardware. We, we did some great things. Um, I was mostly designing tracking devices for both good guys and bad guys. Uh, in fact, one of our bad guy trackers saved a bunch of lives in Colombia many years later because some kidnapped folks were able to, to smuggle one of these in with the kidnapped folks and it, it uh, relayed information about where the prisoners were and, and uh, some special forces teams were able to go in and rescue, it, it saved lives. 
Uh, I'll tell you, as a hardware engineer, the feeling of building something that sits in your hand and talks to a satellite, uh, there's nothing that compares to that. And I, I was so proud of the work that I did designing these pieces of hardware for eight years. Um, I, I was like, well, maybe I should never leave here. But I, I started feeling really complacent. Um, the work started to take on the feeling of a video game that I had already beaten. You know, it's, it's still kind of fun to play, but it's like, I've, I've kind of done all the things here. There's there might be levels of promotion, but I, I really want a new challenge. And so I reached out and there was a friend of mine uh, who I'd known for 30 years, uh, almost 30 years uh, at that point, who had become a vice president of a very small company. It's called Silent Circle. And it dealt with privacy-based applications. It, was, it wasn't working for the government. Uh, it was working for privacy, which um, that's an important thing for me. It can save lives. Uh, it's very different from what I was doing, you know, designing electronics versus hey, I'm, I'm writing software that guarantees privacy are radically different things. And I told my friend, I'm like, I love the, what you're doing sounds awesome, but it's totally outside of my skill set. I've done a little bit of programming. Uh, he's like, it's okay. I've known you. We've been friends for 25 years. We've, he has actually a similar background to mine. I joined the Marine Corps. He joined the Navy. We stayed in touch over the years. Very similar people. We were roommates. We know each other inside and out. And he's like, I know you. You're exactly the right person for this. Come on board. And I was like, this is like the universe is dropping a tailor-made uh, best possible job into my lap. You know, I get to do hackery stuff with my friend. And oh, by the way, this is a small, fast-moving company. There's former Apple, uh, uh, not the CTO, but, but some of the other folks who have worked on the, the secure uh, encryption, uh, the, the secure enclave parts of, of Apple. So there's some big names, some folks that have Wikipedia entries working here. And the rest of the people are Navy SEALs. These are badasses. This is a place where stuff gets done. Uh, so I'm like, sign me up. I don't know what the challenge is, but you tell me I'm the right guy for it. I'll, I'll try it. Four months later, my entire department was laid off. Um, I like to say entire department, but really it was two people. It was like me and my friend. Um, they didn't tell me that we were walking into just a, a, a period of high turnover. There was, there was, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know, the, the possibility of learning new technology was, was not something I could do because there was a lot of infighting at the, the, the C-suite level. And so I, I got on the ground and on the day I interviewed, I talked to six different people. By the time I left four months later, four of those six had already resigned or been fired. It was, it was catastrophic. And that's the first time I've ever been fired. I've always been a, a good and a sometimes great engineer, um, but I've never been fired. So I was, I, I really had to struggle with that. I'm, I'm, I was, sitting there thinking, wow, I, I swung and I, I tried to wing it and I wasn't up to the task. Uh, I, I failed miserably. And so eight days later, I, I was unemployed for all of eight days. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, another opportunity, it's not really my skill set. It's a bit of a stretch, but people who know me tell me I could do it. I'm like, well, I, I got bit by that before. Um, but I, I went there and I tried it again. I said, well, what can I do differently this time? And thankfully, this was a better run organization. One of the first indicators I had was all the engineers talked to each other. It wasn't broken apart into who were you working for and you're working for this guy, you're not allowed to talk to these guys. The, the open communications was one of my biggest indicators that this was a healthy place. Um, I, I got there and I actually did pretty well. It was, it was programming, it was doing uh, offensive cyber work, which it was a bit of a stretch, but I picked it up quickly. An interesting opportunity came a few months in. Um, basically, I, I was in a situation where I had just taken a vacation and come back, and the rest of my team decided to take vacation all at the same time. And the customer said, hey, we have a last minute demo. We'd, we'd like you to send somebody. And I was the only person who was actually able to go. And I thought for a long time, I'm like, this is an opportunity for me to look like a fool. I'm, I'm brand new to this. I'm gonna be engaging with a customer. I have no idea how the customer uses these tools. I barely know how to get my test environment working. Um, so I, I talked to the vice president who was asking for anybody to go because my name was the only one that came up. And I was like, I need to know what success looks like. If success is just me going down there, we say a butt was in a seat. That's, that's one thing. But what does a successful mission look like? Um, I did go. I was very open with what I knew and what I didn't know. And the, the mission was a success. The upshoot of that was when I, when I came back after three weeks of, of supporting this mission, I had a better operational understanding than the other engineers I worked with because they never volunteered for that. It was, it was very much, they, they'd been working there for years and they were very reluctant to step out of their engineering domains 
because the opportunity for failure was pretty high. Um, because of that, even though I'd only been there for five months, they asked me if I wanted to start being a technical lead. And I, imposter syndrome set in. I said, you know, I'm brand new to this. I had one successful thing there. I've had other successful uh, careers, uh, but are you sure I'm the right person for this? And they said, we, we don't need the best engineer. What we need is someone who's not afraid to say yes and who's able to take very chaotic requirements and drive to order and find out that the question I asked was apparently the right one. What does success looks like? Because a lot of times you have people who need something to happen and they're not exactly sure. They, they might not have a very clear picture of what success is in their heads. If you're able to, with your words, drive them to a more clear vision, uh, it's, it's absolutely, uh, you, you're worth more than just the sum of your engineering knowledge. The other thing I wanted to say, um, I've got another quote here from Robert Heinlein. And I think this very much fits in with wing. This is one of my favorite quotes. And a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, count a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. And this is very much uh, along the lines of you know, what, what MacGyver would say. You, you drop that guy into any situation and he's able to make success happen. Um, I was in a very chaotic environment. I was bringing order to it, but life doesn't stop just because you have a hard uh, job. In all that, I got to practice comforting the dying. This is my friend, uh, Ben Preston, who's a former Marine. I, I worked with him in the, in the mid nineties, uh, six foot three fellow hacker, um, giant happy infantry guy. Uh, this is him nine days before he died of leukemia. And so at the time when I'm stepping into a new role and overcoming imposter syndrome and, and really doing a stretch and learning technical skills as quick as I can, I, I got uh, contacted by his sister and said, hey, my brother's too proud to tell anybody, but he's dying and there's really not anything we can do. Would you mind coming down? And uh, he, he talks highly of you. And I wanted to say no. And, and she, I wasn't the only person she reached out to. I was the only person that said yes, because let me tell you, talking to somebody who's got no chance of surviving like that, it was pop quiz time. And it was, somebody needs to come down here and, and be with this guy because he's, he's been living like a hermit. He's been, his, his friends are all over the country, but none of them are coming. Uh, pop quiz, are you able to do this hard thing? And luckily I'd had 20 some years of choosing to do difficult things uh, when there was easier alternatives. And so I was, this is one of the proudest things is that I, I stopped what I was doing because I was uh, in the middle of a very difficult uh, uh, two week cycle at work. And I put a pause and I went down and I saw my friend. Uh, this was, uh, it could have thrown my winging it into uh, my, my success at my brand new company uh, into turmoil, but it, it didn't, it was, a, it was a successful thing. But it was, this was the type of winging it where somebody has to do it and you don't know if you're gonna say the right thing or you don't know if you're gonna be successful at the demo or whatever it is, but somebody's got to do it. And maybe you're the best person. And uh, I, I hope that when you're in that situation, you have a, a strong enough history of incremental steps that get you to the point where you can say yes and you can be successful because uh, those times will happen and you won't get a pop quiz. Uh, that's, that's all I had to share. Uh, thank you for your time. Wow. Um... Somebody said last session that um, these can be like chicken soup for the professional soul. And I think Dan and Louie showed that again. And I'm just gonna take a moment and say, thank you. Um, and um, I'll open it up. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they wanna say um, before we, we, we uh, have Brad sort of step in here too. And, and or we can, like, I'd like to hear the three of you maybe talk about sort of the key indicators and thoughts you have from each of your fuck ups. So, so if, you, if you want me to, I, I can analyze like, like what, what I just heard um, or, or we can just mix it up. But I took notes and I, I actually have a couple of slides that I think could help analyze um, and maybe take stuff apart a little bit. Un unpack and then repack uh, if, if you want me to do that but if, if not then I just chill too 
Yeah, let, well, why don't, why don't we do that? Um, like I said, I'm, I'm experimenting with different formats. Uh, for those of you that, that know me, I've been here whopping three times. And one of the, the formats I really wanted to do was a lot of what Dan and Louie talk about are things from amazing practitioners. And sometimes we need sort of baby steps to help get us there and to realize that. So I asked Brad, because he is one of my most awesome professors ever, to help us see what they do naturally. And Dan and Louie, jump in when you need to, but Brad, why you take it from here? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be really, really brief here, because uh, basically I'm going to analyze and synthesize. That's, that's my, my big thing, is analyze and synthesize. So let me, let me just kind of take a look here. The, the, the perspective that I tend to bring to these uh, things is, is one of uh, decision-making, the decision-making process, right? And, uh, but boy, I got to tell you, Dan and Louie, you are officially my, my two newest heroes. I, I love you both. Like, I'm sitting here cracking up with your stories, and I love you. I, I have no other words to say uh, to you both. Um, the the uh, my my prism that I'm doing uh, comes from. Uh, so I'm I'm old enough uh, that I remember days when they would actually teach classes and schools um, would teach you things like something like extemporaneous speaking. Like there was a class on that. And and one of the things that I we actually joined a club. Uh, and we had competitions in our school on uh, extemporaneous speaking, where you would get up on stage and somebody would hand you an envelope and you would open up the envelope and you would have to read a subject matter and you'd have two minutes to think about it. And then you'd have to talk in front of, and the, the big competition was in front of the entire school, a whole 200 students in an auditorium. And you had to look at this thing for two minutes and then you had to have something to say. And you did it. And, uh, and it was completely off the cuff. But of course the trick is it really wasn't off the cuff. The trick is that what you did was you memorized something else. You memorized a tidbit of a piece. And then the two minutes is how you just basically co-opted what it is that you just read there into something that makes sense. And so mine, mine was, as I recall, uh, in my big competition, imagine a 14 year old boy in front of, it was an all boys school. So they were relentless and heart, heartless, uh, a couple hundred people in the school. And, and as I read my little envelope, it says, uh, does, the, uh, does the bringing of Walt Disney World to Europe represent the McDonaldization of Europe or does it make, uh, does it actually represent the uh, modernization of old families? That was, I'm 14 years old. That's what I read. I'm like, geez, Louise, what am I going to say? But I had memorized a script that I had done. I was also a telephone interviewer. Um, and one of my jobs was to call people on the phone and ask them questions. At that particular time, I was doing a campaign on, uh, on, on uh, razors, uh, the Schick Corporation. And I had memorized this script. And I remember beginning my conference, my, my extemporaneous speaking is, well, as you know, men and women use a variety of methods to remove excess hair from their legs, their underarms and other parts of their body. Uh, and this brings us directly to the McDonald's and, and somehow I phased it in to this whole thing. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is it was really neat because both of you, Dan and Louie, are both telling us that, you know, <clears throat> that uh, effing up is inevitable. It's, it's inevitable. Uh, Dan, you, you are, you're a basis. You're the turn the page guy. What's on the next page? I can't wait to see. I know what I've done now. Lord, Lord, I know not where I go, says Ophelia, right? Um, and, and, uh, and Louis, I mean, you know, not knowing where the heck you're going to be next uh, and having some form of orientation uh, going into it, you have no idea what the heck's going to happen next, you know? And that's, this is great. Your, your F-ups were brilliant. Now, it's funny that the the uh, graduate program that I went to, and I, I try to make every bit that I touch in the one that I teach now uh, like that, one of the requirements to go to this program was that you had what was called an MBWA uh, before they would even accept you into the program. And an MBWA was a mastery by walking around, right? It's like going out and effing up a whole lot of time and that you have already effed up enough. So you actually had to have 10 years of work experience before they would let you into this, into this program, which was really cool because the people who were there, a lot of them were like lawyers who were about to make partner, doctors who were about to make whatever, you know, partner, whatever. And, uh, and it was an MBA program, okay? Uh, anyway, it was fascinating. And what I saw, uh, what both of you seem to be talking about was exactly that. And my, my perspective, uh, I also have a very eclectic past and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I won't go into it at all, except for this, that I have, if, if you were to ask me, if you were to look at my resume, you would say, who orchestrated this train wreck? You know, uh, and, and, and when people ask me what I did, I often say, I, I have no idea what I did, but I, I did stuff. 
Um, but, uh, so I do teach airplane flying. I've been doing that for 20 years. I do that for the FAA. I'm a safety counselor for the FAA. And that's kind of my, kind of a lot of times my background. Um, and one of the big ones that I love to use uh, when I look at accidents and when I look at F-ups, and especially when they turn into things that, that are positive, which in, it seems to me in both of your cases, it, they did. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to have turned out that way during the time, but it seems that you took all of the uh, important stuff from that and, and moved on. Um, so, so I like this thing called the OODA loop. It's uh, Colonel John Boyd. I, I mentioned it before as we were prepping. Um, I think there's a great way, a great prism to take things uh, to take things through. And really, you know, it's nothing new. It's just the scientific method. I know, I know that science and the scientific method are, are mutually exclusive in this particular generation, uh, but there was a time when science meant you could observe stuff, form a hypothesis, and actually it was called a null hypothesis, meaning you were supposed to come up with a hypothesis of how it was not. Then you were supposed to test it, find uh, empirical data to disprove, not prove, but actually disprove the thing that was your null hypothesis and then change it around. That is the basis for which this guy, Colonel John Boyd, if you don't know who he is, you should look him up. He's fantastic. Came up with this thing called the OODA loop, the O-O-D-A. And it's a great way of, uh, of like I said, a prism. Both Dan and Louie uh, began be, begin this process. We're going to bring begin this process with what we're going to call um, an observation. And an observation typically has to do with like look at where you're at, look at who you are, look at what you're doing. Uh, and in both cases, uh, you were looking your your observation. Dan, you know, you you have this free form stream of consciousness view of where careers go, and you know, and and it, and it doesn't matter if you learn to park cars. And, uh, and then delivered pizzas, and then it turned you into a fighter pilot. Uh, all of this stuff builds on itself in a building block manner in its own beautiful puzzle, the very John Locke thing, you know, the, the shape of the bucket is important, but experience fills in the shape of the bucket and then bam, there's your bucket that's full. And, and Louis, uh, same kind of thing, fantastic, uh, with the combat instruction and your orientation, your, your observation of yourself was, hey, I'm MacGyver, give me, give me a pocket knife. And and uh, you know, or uh, and I'm Sam and Al and Ziggy. You know, give me my Ziggy, and uh, I'll figure out how to be a a cheerleader in 1953. Fantastic! I also big fan. In fact, I I got to meet Donald Bellazario. Got a story about that. He, you know, his cousin, his first cousin, was my dentist, and this guy would have given Mangala a run for his money. Anyway, I digress. Back to orientation. The next thing you do is you've got to orient. You've got to look at this stuff. You've got to take the observation, which is to actively absorb your experiences and then understand you and find the bad news. You've got to take that hypothesis and you got to find out where it's wrong. Then, which is what you both did because you said, oh shoot, I better not, better not take a picture of that building again or better not take the, you know, the, uh, the administrivia uh, nightmare ride from hell uh, and paperwork uh, again. And so that allows you to get into the D, the decide. You decide, you make a decision, and which is you measure twice, thank you Sun Tzu, cut once, and ta-da, you execute. But you don't execute blindly, you execute while orienting. And it seems to me that both of your stories fit this perfectly. And again, if you don't uh, know this guy, his name is John Boyd, uh, and uh, he wrote the OODA loop. And it's interesting because as in the, in the FAA, world, we, we use uh, aeronautical decision making, which is the exact same thing. Uh, we look at what are the things that stunt us along the way. And it doesn't seem like either one of you were stunted. You, I would really argue that neither of yours was really truly F up stories other than F up and grow and learn from that. You were great learning vehicles um, because you didn't allow any emotionals, any prejudices, any things that stick in there that make you, you know, stop, you know, just stop where you're at. And a lot of people do that. Um, and and you, you did continue uh, with your behavior modification. You recognized and coped with, uh, okay, this is not the right way. I'm gonna do it differently next time. Uh, and you clearly were doing risk assessment and using all available resources as you went through. And that's, so this is kind of like aviation speak in a lot of ways. And they call this the decide model. And you'll see this really interesting 
that uh, this is exactly the same thing as the OODA loop. We, we observe, we detect, we look at what's going on, we estimate, uh, we need things, what's gonna happen. We orientate, uh, orient by looking at ourselves and uh, then we choose. We choose, we identify the actions and ta-da, we execute. And uh, while we do that, we don't do it blindly, we reevaluate as we go along and ta-da. And again, last thing I have to say on this as far as a lot of F-ups that can really wreck our day and really wreck our, you know, impede our process. And I try not to let this happen to me uh, as well. You know, there are certain things that we have um, that are, you know, attitudes, right? Uh, this anti-authority. Now, anti-authority does not mean don't question authority. It seems that you both question authority on a regular basis. Questioning authority is a good thing. Always hating authority and not learning from authority ever, not necessarily a good thing. And that could slow you down. Impulsivity seems like neither one of you were impulsive and just, okay, close my eyes and hold my beer, which is kind of what we were talking about tonight. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it won't happen to me. It seems like neither one of you were that way, but that can happen. And the old, the old machismo, you know, ah, what the hell, you know, hand me some luckies and uh, we'll just take care of this. Um, and finally, I didn't see any of the resignation of like, oh, well, it's, I'm going to die anyway, so who the hell cares? And uh, so that's basically what I had for you, um, which I hope helps in an analytical sense. I'd say that for me, especially like early in my career, some of those hazardous behaviors were definitely there. You know, you, when you're 24, you feel like you lead a charmed existence or you're like, oh, I'm used, I, 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 I'm smart enough to do whatever, whatever challenges fate throws at me. And you need experiences to put you in your place. It's, I don't gamble, but, you know, I hear the same expression from folks that go to Vegas, you know, the, the, the Vegas is the place where your, your local uh, uh, poker champions go to just experience defeat. Um, I have a boss that said something that really stuck with me uh, about it, it concerns like local maximas in, in mathematics where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm the best at the, in my local group or my local room, I'm, I'm the best at this particular thing. And I don't want to step outside that box because I don't want to go back to that beginner mindset. And he said, in 20 years, you're going to be 20 years older. And are you going to be somebody that has 20 more years of experience? Or are you going to have one more year of experience that gets repeated 20 times? Because those are two different things. And the folks that are able to say, I've got 20 legitimate years of experience, they're learning something new every year by finding what are the boundaries of what I know? Where is what I know not, not sufficient? And you, you need to find places that are pushing you to the point where you are fucking up or you're not pushing yourself enough. Very much. Uh, so Dan, what are, what are your thoughts also on this? I know you've seen sort of your your set of, of mentoring and stuff like that. And one of the things I always ask is how can we be better mentors um, to people that are younger, but also how do we be, able to be better mentees um, in learning? Yeah, I think uh, part of being a good mentor is is being a good student. And, and you know, it's got a, a mentoring relationship ought to be two ways. I mean, I was born in 1951. Okay, I'm an old fart. I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, but when when I mentor somebody, I also always try to show that incredible respect. Maybe maybe the lucky thing I had was was I had a father and a grandfather who early on told me that everybody you meet for the rest of your life is going to know more than you do about something. And I've also learned that life is too short for me to want to find out what it is for a whole lot of people. I mean, come on, yeah. But but the reality is that respect for the individual. Uh, I, I think uh, I am a alleged world class expert in a particular field. Uh, that particular field, if it's important to you, then that that may be meaningful. If it's not important to you, then I am the world's skinniest fat person. I mean, so what? Uh, you know, all the I've I've got credentials awards stuff out the wazoo i've got them in boxes around somewhere because as as you know uh, brad you pointed out uh i'm about what's next uh there's a there's a jazz uh pianist uh, uh earl garner and somebody what he's he wrote misty look at me i was helpless as an epileptic uh, if <clears throat> Somebody once asked him, they said, you never play it the same way twice. And he said, why would I? How boring is that? And that's me. Uh, uh, you know, I, if I can't find a new frontier, something new to work on that hasn't been done before, then I'm not interested. 
I did a lot of stuff because that's what I had to do early in my career. And when I reached a certain stage, I was able to start picking and choosing. Can't always pick and choose everything, but, but you know, uh, go to Monticello. You see where J J Thomas Jefferson's headstone. It says, Father of the Virginia, author of the Virginia Statutes of Religious Freedom, author of the Declaration of Independence, Father of the University of Virginia. Of all the things Jefferson did, those are the three things he wanted to be remembered for. And that's something I used to do with executive successions sessions is if I, if you had to write down three things for your epithet right now, what would they be? And then I'd say, uh, after they, you know, struggle and everybody sweats and tries to think out what would they want to be remembered for? They you know, usually come to the, uh, the decision that 90% of what they've been working on is not anything they really care to be remembered for, you know, and why not? Why not? So that's the challenge is, is, you know, as you're looking forward, yeah, I screw up and I keep moving and I keep moving and it's hard to hit a moving target, but uh, uh, share and learn. I what Everybody on this call is a heck of a lot smarter than I am on a whole lot of topics, you know? Uh, and if I ever need a knife fight, I, a knife fight, I'm going to Louis for sure, you know? I mean, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's sharing and it's learning and it's growing and then we just keep on moving on. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we're on our last couple of minutes and I just wanted to thank everybody um, and, and remind everybody that this is every, every third Wednesday of the month, we have a new topic. If you're interested in being part of it, please step in. Um, you can do as much or as little as you want. Um, and I, I always invite people, hey, if you wanna be part of also the group that sort of talks about things at the end on, on key things you've learned like Brad did today, sort of to break it down for us, people who see what Dan and Louie do and go just like, what kind of magic do they do to make this happen? Um, you know, please uh, give me a heads up and, and, and I'll invite you in. So I'm gonna let uh, Brad close because he was nice enough to step in and any parting thoughts, Professor Levy? Uh, thank you, Brigitte. Uh, boy, this was fantastic. You, you're doing an amazing job with this, Brigitte. And Dan and Louis, you are absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all that wonderfulness. Uh, and and uh, if we're gonna end with epitaphs, uh, why not? Uh, let's go down uh, Kurt Vonnegut Road and uh, be Billy, Billy Pilgrim for a second. Uh, he tried. Very nice. Well, I, um, I'll, I'll end it there then um, and I'll, I'll stop recording, um, but if anybody wants to stop and talk or anything like that or has any other questions,